How is everyone? I hope you've all had a really um, enjoyable week and you're all home from work and finished your grooming for the day. Um, I'm joined today by Joe Middleton um, from Franchise Business School and uh, I thought it'd be really important and really interesting to speak to Joe because uh, potentially we've all got businesses that we might be able to franchise and we all have this burning question. I asked my wife tonight, oh, should we franchise our business? And uh, I got glared at. And, uh, and then Emma said, um, if it means I don't have to do dog grooming anymore, then maybe, maybe you can. So welcome, Joe. How are you doing? Hi, uh, I'm all good. Thank you. All good. It's um, it's really good to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. That's all right. You had a good day. You had a power cut. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> so Facebook, WhatsApp and Instagram all went down earlier in the week and then power cut until about four, half four today. And it really makes you realise how much you rely on sort of digital technology world these days. But um, and then as I was, <laughs> we've got alpacas and um, I went up to do the alpacas bedtime feeds and um, found one was lame. So we've had to have the vet out. So I'm sporting the uh, windswept <laughs> look today. The uh, alpaca farmer look, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've got jodhpurs on underneath, covered in mud. So <laughs> you've uh, got my, my Zoom uniform. <laughs> we, um, we've got a horse and we just you just know, don't you, as it comes towards winter, or you might not, how long you had alpacas for. But I've got two horses as well. <laughs> yeah, you can uh, you can monitor like the um, how bad the winter is by how deep you sink into your field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely so true yeah, yeah. that's quite an interesting one the, the Facebook um sort of scenario because I put that out on the group the next day saying you know who who obviously it was all working when we all woke up which was like sigh mm -hmm. of relief for some but it does make you wonder it does make you think doesn't it and I quickly signed up to Twitter and put put myself onto Twitter just in case people wanted to sit, to contact me but I've got a website and uh, YouTube obviously and podcast so I can reach people but I kind of put that question out into the group saying you know how did you feel not having that access and it's something we all probably take for granted quite a lot doesn't it so yeah yeah absolutely one of the things I harp on about is having an email list and trying to get all your contacts moving from one platform to another and get them signing up to your email list because you don't own Facebook obviously um and I actually got uh, banned once because I had my profile name as my personal profile name as Joe Dog First Aid which obviously was yeah. not my real name yeah. and Facebook um twigged that that wasn't my real name and they actually banned me from Facebook until I sent them in some ID but that meant that I couldn't access any of my Facebook pages my business pages either luckily I had my um my admin lady on as a, a and admin on my pages yeah. but had it not been for that I would have been completely up the creek without a paddle really yeah and I think that's something that as a, an admin or, or monitoring the groups and stuff that I do I suppose I need to be careful that no one puts me in Facebook jail for any sort of um, bad posts so no one no one out there put any bad posts in the group and put me in Facebook <laughs> Because that'd be it. That'd be me done for a while, wouldn't it? You'll be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. I have to um, get a, another profile and re-log into my group. So, mm. yeah. So, um, really nice to have you on. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your your business journey, your your business history, how you became a, an entrepreneur, and uh, let us know a little bit about you. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know how long have we got <laughs> I don't sit still for long <laughs> so it's quite a lot to tell um I guess firstly to start with I've always been a dog nut um through and through I grew up uh, around the show ring my mum um had show nerves so it was me um doing all the handling in the ring um literally showing at, at Crufts age about 10 uh, because my mum just didn't didn't um have the nerve to go in um and did all my junior handling stuff through the kennel club and um and uh just was a dog nut we had Belgian Shepherd dog Malinois but through the junior handling stuff I showed every shape size breed um going and then got paid um, by breeders to go in the ring and show their dogs um as well and then in my early 20s, I got involved quite heavily in the rescue world um, and I have been involved in the rescue world ever since. Um, 
I fostered, um, we, we stopped at, at 100, but that was like 2013. So we fostered a, an awful lot of dogs. Um, all our dogs have been failed fosters for the last 20 odd years. Um, and at the moment, unfortunately, we can't foster because our dog has severe epilepsy um to the point that she's actually been booked into the vets to be put to sleep because that's what the vet said that we needed to do um last august 2020 um and we uh, she has cluster seizures so she has sort of 20 seizures over two or three days yeah. um so um we she's very heavily uh, medicated and that holding her at the moment um, luckily, we asked for a um, referral to the veterinary hospital for a second opinion before having her put to sleep. And uh, that's how we've managed now five months straight, fit free. Um, I always feel like I've got to touch wood because <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's, it's horrible. But it does mean that we can't foster at the moment. And we're literally just focusing on making her the most pampered princess in the land. <laughs> Um, so I went self-employed first of all in uh, 1999. I worked with the Chamber of Commerce um, business advisor and um, started up a, a virtual assistant business, which was actually before its time because the world had quite gone digital. Um, so I started that up um, and then um, did that mainly for doctors and students typing dissertations, so not dog related at all. Um, I ran that for a couple of years and then fell pregnant with my eldest, um, who um, that sort of scuppered my, <laughs> my self-employment journey for a little minute then. Um, and then um, had a few years out and um, wanted, had another baby, wanted to do something that worked around the children. Um, I had to go back into employment so that I could get a mortgage um, in that time. And then found myself in a position where I was dropping the children off at a childminder at 7.15 for breakfast, going to work sitting in a job that I didn't enjoy all day to pick the children up after they'd had their tea to give them their baths and put them to bed and I just thought there's there's got to be more to life than this I'm literally sitting there doing something I don't enjoy to pay for a house that no one's in and childcare to see children that I want to spend time with hey, you spend all your salary just on the childcare in the end literally yeah. you're just working to pay someone else's salary um so I um started thinking about what I really enjoyed and children preschool children love their sort of innocence <laughs> they're like dogs without the fur um <laughs> and um dogs as well um dogs horses always been uh, sort of uh, a big part of my life um, so I did some dog behaviour qualifications and um, I launched a pet care business mm -hmm. and um, did some dog behaviour work, decided I didn't actually like the um, owners maybe as much as I like <laughs> dogs. <laughs> so um, I, I did uh, and ran puppy classes with a, another local dog trainer as well. Um, so the puppy class business is still going, she still runs that um and the pet care business is still going i sold that in 2015 2016 um and then while, while i had the pet care business um one of my own dogs came back to me on a walk covered in blood and um i i just lost it really and um, if it had been a human i i've got loads of human pediatric first aid qualifications and i would have known what to do um, but because it was my dog, I couldn't translate the skills and I sort of th thought I was going to pass out. The field went for a little spin and I picked him up, chucked him in the car, didn't attempt to pressure bandage, didn't bring a head to the vets. Um, loads of steps that I kind of missed out. I literally just chucked him in the car and <laughs> drove down to the vets. I didn't know if there was going to be a vet there. I didn't know if they were able to see him. I just <laughs> panicked. Um, and so I went on a dog first aid course, and this is 
gosh, probably 2011, 2012, maybe, I think 11. And um, the course was packed, literally jam packed. And I didn't feel that I got what I needed from it. It was too much. Um, there wasn't the opportunity to ask questions. And when you did try and ask one, it was very sort of defensive, bobbed off sort of answer. And it, it I'm sure that it, it definitely gave me some knowledge, but it wasn't maybe how I would have liked to have run my own. So that's exactly what I did. I worked with um, some vets and put a dog first aid course together. Um, and in 2013, delivered the first course. No intention of it being a big business, definitely no intention of franchising it. I had thought about franchising the pet care business, but I dog first aid, no one had, ever franchised the dog first aid business um, so that wasn't even on my radar at all and it was literally just a, a little course for local dog groomers walkers in the side room at the village hall and, and that was all I had planned because I just felt it was really important that no one was left with a client's dog yeah. um, feeling unprepared like that and I see you've got Sophie Bell coming on to talk yeah yeah brilliant um because every every pet professional should learn emergency canine care so i marketed this dog first aid course just um 100 of proceeds to um forever hounds trust who's a charity that i've been a trustee of and, and a massive fan of um and it got so fully booked i had to book a second date off the back of the first one. And I wasn't doing any paid advertising. I would literally just put a few Facebook posts out on my, my pet care page mm -hmm. and shared them in a couple of groups. And I thought, oh, okay, people really wanna, wanna learn this stuff. And then I got a call from a rescue in Wales, um, Friends of the Animals RCT, um, who still host the, the dog first aid courses to this day. And they wanted me to go over to Wales to deliver it. Um, so before I knew it, I had a, a fleet of four vans, a pet care team, going out myself Monday to Friday on the pet care front, and Saturday and Sunday I was pinging around the country delivering the dog first aid courses, literally sort of North Wales on the Saturday to Essex on the Sunday because my admin lady's geography <laughs> by her own admission it was not great <laughs> um but it, it was just incredible I mean we were teaching um border control dog handlers the you know the dogs that sniff money and people and drugs coming into the country teaching mm -hmm. them first aid teaching police military it, it just it, it was incredible um but I was wiped out yeah and then we had some trademark issues um and um i say trademark issues, intellectual property issues um around our course content being um people attending our course and then copying the content basically a couple of times um and i, I contacted a solicitor and i've always worked for business coaches and I, i'm a big believer that um same as a footballer will have a football coach I think all business owners should have a, a business coach as well um so I spoke to a solicitor spoke to a business coach and said look how do I protect this don't break myself <laughs> and make sure that the the same quality is rolled out time and time again um without people pinching it and both said franchise it and I thought I can't <laughs> I can't, who am I to franchise it because franchising is like McDonald's or Subway yeah. or something it's not dog first aid um and but I did <laughs> um and I sold the pet care business because it was kind of one or the other was going to be franchise and um I kind of realized that that's the bit that I love is the building of a business and then selling them so that's what I've I've done ever since um so I franchised dog first aid and then I sold it last September with franchisees literally from the north of Scotland down to the Isle of Wight the franchising journey was absolutely incredible but it was a complete roller coaster as any entrepreneurial 
journey is. There are so many things that I learned along the way and so many things that I wish I'd known before I started franchising. Um, just, just so much. Um, I've won some amazing awards. I've been quoted in Forbes magazine. Um, I know some of the most amazing people that I could just ring and pick the phone up to that run massive organisations all through my franchising journey. So when I sold Dog First Aid, I'd already started to build up Franchise Business School to kind of help other petpreneurs and entrepreneurs to franchise their business, but to learn from my journey and from mistakes I made. Yeah, learn from your mistakes, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And some of them very expensive ones as well. <laughs> because the franchising isn't a cheap, cheap way to go, but the rewards can be incredible. Well, it's um to like explain to everyone, um, and we when you say franchise, people might not even realise McDonald's is a is a franchise or um, Subway. I was looking, I was in Subway at the weekend. I was like, oh, I wonder how much it is to own a Subway, and so maybe we can uh, explain what what franchising your business means. Mm. So franchising is basically where you license someone to run your brand with all of your operational systems, um, your processes, and you commit to a term uh, of X amount of years of helping them to, um, or not supporting them, I suppose mm -hmm. is the right word, to run the business. So you're not running it for them, you're supporting them to implement your systems and processes. So you will provide them with an operations manual and you will commit to making sure that what's in that operations manual is the best practice of running your business model. Yeah, so it's not just um, sell it and forget, is it? It's not just no. sell it and you just you know, support. There's an element of support there from you as well. Absolutely, yeah, because it's in your best interest to make sure that the brand is successful and I do joke with people that you sort of lay your life down for the brand but it is all about protecting that brand um, and believing in what you do I mean if you are going to live and breathe that brand and and um, make sure that it's successful on a, a bigger scale you've got to be really passionate about it like I was about dog and am about dog first aid um and uh, now I've, i run a, a business that is all about financial literacy with children completely different but I, it's something i'm really passionate about because i think that all children should have a financial education for, from an early age um so no matter what business it is that you you're thinking of franchising whether it's a, a dog grooming business or it's a pie making company you've got to be really passionate about it and I'm guessing that the, the people listening to this are really passionate about what they do because they're dog nuts just like me <laughs> and when we talk uh, when we talk brand some people might just think logo but it's more than that isn't it it's it's the business voice it's the the colors the logos the um you know there's so much more to a, just a brand it's, uh... it just, yeah, absolutely. So it's the look and the feel. Um, it is the logo. Yeah, absolutely. That's part of the intellectual property. And in your franchise agreement that you provide, um, provide the people coming on board to run your model with, um, it, it will actually detail the trademark number so that they are, have got the right for that term to operate using your trademark. But if we go back to that McDonald's analogy, um, it, if you go into a McDonald's in Kent or you go into a McDonald's in Wales, you should have the same kind of experience to, mm. up to a certain level um, because everything is systemized and processes. Um, can, I, can I just clarify a couple of terms that people might not yeah. be familiar with? Franchisor is the person who owns model so I was the franchisor of dog first aid a franchisee is the person that buys the right to operate that business model usually within a defined geographical area not always 
Right. You don't have to give your franchisees a de defined geographical area, but it's quite common for them to purchase the right to operate, say, in, I don't know, the AB1 postcode uh, of Aberdeenshire with a set amount of population and demographics that you know work to operate your business model. Um, so franchisor is the brand owner, the franchisees are the people that purchase the right to operate within there. And they're not employees, they're business owners in their own right. So they will do their own accounts, they yeah. will employ their own staff. So they're, they're their own business owners, um, but under your umbrella. And do they have the same, are they able to use your, obviously they, they create their own Facebook pages and Instagram and websites or do they, and they just use your branding and your, your mm. uh, you know, would you have the same copywriter for all of the websites? Or? So that kind of goes back to what I'm saying about protecting the brand at all costs. Yeah. Um, you need to have everything like that set up by head office so that you can jump in if you need to. So if um, I don't know, I don't want to wish bad on anyone, but if someone got taken out by a bus and you need to jump in and manage their business for them until that situation's resolved, head office has got a level of control over their social media accounts, their emails, etc. Now that doesn't mean to say if you're a franchisee, your franchisor is, is watching you or micromanaging you or anything like that. It is literally for the protection of the brand that it needs to be set up like that. Likewise, if, um, if I don't want to offend anyone, but if for <laughs> example, I, I had a, um, a grooming salon and everything that I did was calm and um, handled the dogs in a, a really um, ethical manner. But then my neighbouring franchisee um, put collars on the dogs when they came through the door or something like that. Um, or, or candidate played, played loud music, like loud dance. Yeah, yeah. They maybe, I was going to say something like, "Okay, so everyone is using the lamb book as they left or something." But yeah, maybe loud music is probably. <laughs> um, it could bring the brand into disrepute. So the franchisee, franchisor, needs to be able to manage a situation um, to make sure that the all franchisees businesses are protected so although it might seem a bit big brothers watching you to someone who's not used to a franchise concept when you're looking at coming on board with a, a an organization as a franchisee actually it is all done with the best interests of your business success at the end of the day um, and the more the franchise grows the more your business grows as well so i own four toddler football franchises so I'm a franchisee as well. Um, so I, I, I can see the different hats. <laughs> um, and I can see everything from a franchisee perspective too. So I own four to toddler football franchises um, and I love them. <laughs> um, but I know that ultimately all decisions that the franchisor makes are to benefit my individual businesses. And the more that they grow, the brand so for example they've just expanded to um, Belgium Northern Ireland master license has just sold um, Australia's just going and the more that they grow the more my individual franchise territory businesses are worth they're adding value to my assets mm. so yeah it's it's I could talk about it all night, Bill. <laughs> um, so Catherine's asked a question. I was just wondering if this is the right terminology. Um, she said, once you sell them the franchise, do you get an, any additional money? Is that the right terminology, sell them the franchise? or mm. Yeah, so you're selling franchise territories or selling um, selling franchise business. And you, you talk about recruiting franchisees. Right. Um, Although they're not employees by any stretch, they are they are franchisees. Um, so it is the power is in your hands, Catherine. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yes, you will need to get an ongoing royalty fee. Um, so it's usually based on a percentage of turnover per month, but it can also be a flat rate as well. 
The other thing that most franchisors will charge monthly is something called an ad levy or a national marketing budget fee. And that's basically where franchisees pay every month into a central pot, which is then used for marketing the brand across the UK. So, um, for example, you might have a um, franchise fee that is 10% of their revenue. I think typically you're looking at eight to 12 and a half percent franchise fee, but that can vary. Um, and then maybe 20 quid a month or something or 2% of their turnover as, um, as a, a national ad levy. Um, but I mean, you could use that for your Google AdWords. You could to go across the UK, you could use it on Facebook boosted posts, you could use it on an exhibition at stands, but ultimately the franchisee will have the right to ask you as a franchisor what you spend that money on and for you to evidence that to them. So it's not like you can just go, yay, I'm getting all this money in. It's very much a transparent, as an ethical franchisor, everything that you're doing should be transparent. Um, and if the, the franchisee asks to see your ad levy pot, um, then then that's fine. They should be able to access. So I, I suppose I keep, I, my mind keeps coming back to McDonald's because it's the most recognised and not known about franchise. So McDonald's will collect a pot of money from all of their franchise fees, and then that will help pay for the um adverts on telly and the radio and the signage at the side of the road so it benefits everyone doesn't it national television and it does it does but um what what you can't do as a franchisor is you provide franchisees with the model and it's up to them to run them within the par parameters that you set what you can't do is say um right this month everyone's going to do 10 percent off ears um, right. you can't enforce that on their business. You can say, we're going to do an advert that's going to go out across the UK. We're going to put some budget behind it um, and we're going to put 10% off ears to get customers through your doors in participating salons. So if, for example, McDonald's and then the franchisee can opt in to whether they want to, to do that offer or not if you if you look at mcdonald's offer it will say in participating restaurants at the bottom somewhere yeah. so that's the get out for them so um another uh question that's just come to mind is um you know if if i was to franchise my dog grooming business in ken and maybe we set one up um east ken would they charge the same prices would could we say you charge the same prices as we do or do they have them in, they have the ability to choose their own prices. Yeah, so the franchisor can set a maximum, but only recommend a minimum. They right. can't set a minimum price, but they can set an upper limit so that franchisees um, uh, have got the choice, I suppose, of, of where they're going without pricing themselves out. Um, just, just want to pop back to Catherine's question a minute about the... Um, <laughs> Uh, the um, percentage there uh, or whatever the ongoing royalty is that you decide it might be that you decide it's a flat rate of 150 a month or something um, usually you'd give um, say three months free fee free to start with whatever your training period is for a franchisee because you'll need to provide them with a, a training package to help them launch and then the ongoing support whatever your um, your costs are going to be on going from month four onwards or whenever it is that you decide need to be able to support your business longer term so i always recommend to people to do their five-year plan <laughs> i know boring boring um but it's great if you've got loads of colored pens like me <laughs> Because you can draw lots of uh, lots of swirls in different colours and get really arty with it because it brings it to life, makes it fun and exciting. So do your five year plan and where you want your business to be in five years. How many franchisees do you need paying what into the pot? I see so many people franchising their business and starting off too low on their franchise fees. And then 
ultimately that that money has got to help your business to to grow and it's got to pay your wages admin staff maybe a franchise development manager at some point so you need to make sure that you're not setting yourself up to fail by charging four percent franchise fee or something when that's not going to be enough longer term to support your business um, and the other thing uh, around that is that you need to make sure that when you're franchising your, your business and providing people with your model, you're remembering that everyone learns differently and at diff just like dogs, you know, everyone learns differently, different paces and in different ways as well. So all the documents that you prepare, and there will be many, um, you need to make sure that they meet all the different learning styles and that you're able to, to meet people's individual training requirements as well as a broad overview too. So you got to work out your financial um, goals that you want to achieve and make sure that the, the sums that you're charging, your franchisees are, are meeting those goals, isn't it? Yeah, I had a meeting with a, a franchisee the other week, sorry, franchise all the other week, <laughs> um, who's gone back to work because her franchisees, um, and she's she's kept keeping the business going, but she's having to go back to work to pay money into the business to keep the franchise going because she signed these agreements with the franchisees. Um, so you, you need to make sure that you're setting it up for, for long-term success to meet your goals. Yeah, it's no different than start, starting your dog groomers and, and starting your prices too cheap. It takes you a very long time to get them to where they want to be. So if I was to, um, so I want to franchise my dog groomers, what are the, what would you say are the pros to, to creating a franchise and franchising the business? Oh, there are so many pros and there are cons as well. Um, so pros, I'd say the top ones are that you get big business growth. Um, you get to have not a passive income, which it's often thought that it is, but it's not. Um, you, you get the money coming in from the royalties every month, mm -hmm. um, but you do need to keep working on your business model and keep working with those franchisees to um, help support them. So. Um, people um, will say oh that's great so if you've got 20 franchisees paying you x amount a month then you get it's not like that at all it's not a magic money tree that pops up at the bottom of the garden um, you get to see your baby <laughs> your your <laughs> business baby yeah. um, make a big impact on lots more people so if you know that your dog grooming salon um, helps owners to feel reassured that their dog's in safe human hands um, when it's at the groomers, you can roll that out in a way that the messaging isn't lost. Um, you Like with Dog First Aid, it's all protected. Um, and everything that you do in your salon, from the way that it's laid out, from the way your teams are treated, to um, how you recruit your staff, to how you train your staff, to how you want them to handle dogs, everything, every last thing you can make sure is rolled out in the same way time and time again and replicated to reach more people and make a, a bigger difference to dogs and their owners. So there, there's some of the cons. And of course, there is financial reward as well. Um, but you need to do those figures and you need to do your five year plan. How much are you going to charge for a territory? Your first three should be pilots. They should be cheaper, if not your first five. And you want to work closely to iron out any teething problems. And then once you, you go um, iron out teething problems, and you've got those first ones on board, then you can start selling more um at a, at a more reasonable price to get the revenue in so yeah i guess that there's some of the the pros do you want to hear some cons yeah, i think that's, <laughs> i think that's a very important i don't think you could come into this lightly could you so no so um i guess one of the biggest cons or one of the i don't know if it's a con but one of the things that you need to really um be conscious of is your mindset and making sure that you're thinking like a franchisor rather than a dog grooming salon owner. So thinking, 
going from selling something that is less than a hundred pounds to going to selling something that's thousands is, is a mindset shift and the ideal customers are different mm -hmm. so lots of work around your ideal customers for franchisees um, are they Joe Bloggs dog owner who is an accountant who's already got their own business it, it's not that person it's someone who's passionate about dogs who wants to go into business for themselves but not on their own they haven't quite got the confidence to take the leap and and go for it or maybe they've tried and it, it's not worked and they want that proven successful business model that you've got um so mindset is or can be a con if you've not got the right mindset in place um another con i guess is the um expense of franchising and knowing not to be afraid to say no to people because people see um i suppose you're a bit of an easy target as a franchisor i've been to meetings before where i've had people literally queuing up to talk to me at the end of the meeting suppliers wanting to sell and um, they're lovely people they're trying to do their they're trying to earn a crust as well you know um but at the same time you've got to protect the brand at all costs and you can't go spending money willy-nilly and if it's not going to be getting a return on investment then you've got to be really careful especially at first um plus there are lots of um franchise consultants who have never franchised the business themselves mm -hmm. you've got to make sure that you go in with someone who's walked the walk and isn't just talking the talk um I got when I, <laughs> I was working with a franchise consultant who did me cash flow forecast to show prospective franchisees. Um, and I sacked him after that because he gave me these cash flow forecasts. And if I'd given them to people who were going to come on board, I could have had such legal action taken against me because it was basically promising people they'd be earning like 100 grand a year and stuff. And it, that's just not realistic for the business model at all. Yeah. Um, by any stretch, this, I mean, even in year five, you're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it would be lovely if they could, but I, I, it would have just set unrealistic expectations to people coming on board. So I guess looking out for sharks, not being a, afraid to say no and making sure that your mindset's on point and working on your mindset and never stopping learning because uh, we've got to be like sponges. No one knows everything, do we? Never, never, never stay still. It is, it is an investment, isn't it, to franchise your business? Yeah, it can, it can be if it's done right. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, I, I hate when I see people set up their business that, as a franchise and fall um, and don't don't make it because they've put their heart and soul into that and they haven't. Uh, they've been misled somewhere. And and I tell probably I'd say about 60, 60 70 percent of people. Um, that I talk to that franchising isn't right for you and um, mm. I, I'd rather be honest about that up front and, and give them some pointers and go away and work on this for the next year and then we can have another conversation then go yeah yeah give me some money I'll work with you <laughs> and, and set you up to fail because that's just um, it's just not cricket is it? <laughs> no and I, I suppose that actually answers um, one of my, my questions like can any business be franchised well perhaps that needs to be rephrased you know, can anyone run a franchise? So, so, so maybe every business can be franchised, but it's actually the person that you might struggle mm. to franchise your business. So I'd say any um, any profitable business could be franchised. Um, mm -hmm. if you're you're running a business that hasn't got a profit margin in it, then replicating that and selling it on to someone <laughs> else is not fair. <laughs> um, but, and also you wouldn't earn any royalties would you if they're not making a no. <laughs> um but um i think that it is all about that mindset and recognizing your strengths and weaknesses and working with people who complement your weaknesses if you like um to make sure that you're able to provide franchisees with the, the full package that they should be getting when they franchise um 
and so I mean the fra I love the franchise world because it's such a win-win as a franchisee you're buying into a brand that's established the franchisor has already done a, loads of the hard work for you um, and you're able to be part of something that's much bigger each franchisee brings something different to the table. They've got different skill sets, different backgrounds, and they will bring something different to the table as well. So it's a, a complete collective. And if you've got, um, I don't know, if you, you've got your dog grooming salon at one end of the road and you've got a competitor a couple of hundred yards away, you're not going to go along and knock on their door and sort of say, oh, so how do you get your customers then? And um, did you pinch Joe Bloggs off me? And it, it, it's competition. And I always believe in, um, in competitors, uh, are friends just running a different business. That's, you mm -hmm. know, um, but you, it's not the same as with a franchise where you're all sharing your, your best secrets to make your business a success because it's in everyone's best interests to grow the brand. Um, yeah. so it is a really unique feel. Yeah, and when you grow your brand, you know, and again, we know McDonald's, you can just go anywhere and you instantly recognize and your children bug you and uh, ask for <laughs> ask to use that brand, don't they? And that's what you want with your, your franchise, I suppose. Catherine um, has asked for each franchise E, do they set everything up themselves based on your model or do you have to provide equipment and other things and mm -hmm. just train them? And I, to, just to add to that, do you, do you go out and find the buildings or the, you know, provide the vans or the, the trailers to, for them to operate in? So again, the power is in your hands. However, with that whole protecting the brand um, element in mind, I would say that you would um, provide a spec for the salon, um, minimum sizing, um, exactly how you want it laid out, et cetera, et cetera. At least the first few, I'd be going out with them and helping them, but ultimately it would be their responsibility to source the, the location. Um, I'd also have in my operations manual um, around how, um, how to negotiate on a lease, what minimum terms you want on that lease, what break clause you want in there, um, et cetera, et cetera. Just everything that you've learned about running your business, document it, get it down on paper, and then remember about all the different learning styles that I've been talking about as well. Um, and make it um, almost like a, a dummy's guide to running your business. Um, so literally, take a picture of how you want that grooming table laid out that kind of thing so that you're meeting the visual element as well as documenting it and, and writing it um, incorporate videos as much as you can and have it on a um, shared folder like um, g drive where you can share it as a view only so then you can update it and always have shared best practice in there mm. um, completely gone away from what the question was do they are they <laughs> responsible for the for their own leases or is the franchise uh, responsible for it? No, so um, they would set up either as a limited company or a sole trader, whichever one you specify that they need to do. If it's a limited company, the franchise agreement needs to be between the franchise or you, the franchisee as an individual person and the limited company as well as a separate legal entity. So if it's a sole trader, it's just between you and the franchisee, the individual. But if it's a limited company, that's seen as a separate legal entity. So it's set up between the three of you. Otherwise, that limited company, um, they could sell the shares out of, or they could, um, uh, the limited company could, if it's just between you and the individual, the limited company could be sold off to a different dog grooming company down the road or something. So you need to make sure that you're protected as much as, as possible. Um, and then they are responsible for recruiting staff. They're responsible for the lease. lease. Um, it's completely their business under your umbrella. Right, I see. So, um, so you'd say this is the equipment we want you to use but you go out and 
yeah but on their insurance certificate on their lease um, you want your interest as head office noted on there um, so if things did go pear-shaped you've got the right to step in as well mm. um, and um, you just mentioned something there that I completely forgot equipment <laughs> equipment so preferred suppliers um, you should have preferred suppliers list. What you find is because you bring volume to suppliers in terms of business, um, they should start to reflect that in their pricing. So you should be able to get a, a good price for your franchisees. It's not uncommon for franchisors to put a markup on the products, the equipment, etc., that is being sold onto um, franchisees. I personally would have as much of it branded as possible um, and then sold on to franchisees. Um, so you either have a um, fulfillment company that you use. And if you're going to um, provide a lot of products and a lot of equipment, um, it's better to get prices now because they'll, the fulfillment company has to put a margin on as well. Um, so it's better to get prices now and have that list at the price, including the fulfillment company, even if you're not going to use them for the first three franchisees, because then when it does get to that volume that you've got to use a fulfillment company, otherwise you're suddenly going to hoik prices right up and there'll be an uproar. So it's better to start as you mean to go on. Um, so your your French so shampoos and obviously um, shampoos should all be the same in each one of your branches shouldn't they so they'd be coming to you to buy those shampoos and you'd be putting your little markup on it and then supplying it yeah um however um it, products equipment stuff like that is the bane of most franchisors lives and most will want to use a fulfillment company it's all right when you've got one or two franchisees but when it's sort of 10 o'clock on a friday night and everyone's yeah. left the office and you're there packing up boxes to send out to franchisees it's not much fun no <laughs> outsource it outsource as much as you can that's it absolutely and um how often would you um check your your franchisees are doing what they should be do you do spot checks do you is it a bit like uh, renting a, a house they have to give you have to give your franchisees notice that you're coming to inspect mm. them or can you just turn up and say right let me see your Hi. yeah i brought my dog <laughs> in for a group <laughs> yeah so mystery shoppers are quite common in the franchise right. world um but um in the franchise agreement if you've got a, a franchise it, you should always use a franchise specific solicitor always always use a franchise specific solicitor because they are familiar with the jargon and um, familiar about how it all needs to be based around protecting the brand um, and you'll get franchisees saying but this this agreement's really weighted to you and you say, yes it is because i need to protect the brand <laughs> um so yeah basically um you just need to make sure that all your systems processes everything is tied up as much as you can sewn up um and everything's protected um so that you've got the right to pop in and um inspect the premises whenever you want to or a member of your team um it should always say so it's not onus isn't always on you it can be anyone that works for you or with you excellent excellent so and can you um get rid of your franchise e if you know i take it if they if they're doing something wrong or they're bringing your friend your brand into disrepute there'll be terms in the contract to to part, get rid, like yeah, part, <laughs> part company bury them <laughs> you know, so can, I take it you can uh, break your contract or you yeah. have to go with warnings and all sorts what's the sort of process for that yeah, absolutely. So when I'm talking about the salon lease, um, the length of the lease, it would be usual to have the franchise agreement of a similar length. Right. Um, so about a five year with a, a two year break clause on your shop lease. Um, but there's no break clause in the franchise agreement. So the franchise agreement um, would then be um, sort of in line with the um, the, the shop lease and you've got that term there 
And I've forgotten your question again, Bill. I, obviously, it's too late at night. <laughs> um, how do you? How, how can you? Can you sack your franchisee? Oh yeah. How, how can they get out of there? <laughs> I've heard terms where they like you can they sell their their franchise so can, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, so any good franchisor will support their franchisee at every stage of the journey, whether that's their exit strategy or not. I always encourage franchisees to have an exit strategy because I think you should always build your business to be an asset. Mm. Um, however, most franchise agreements will detail in there that um, you can't sell it unless you're in full compliance with all the terms of the agreement. So if you've not paid your franchise fees, if you've, um, I don't know, had three customer complaints that month or something um, and brought the brand into disrepute, like you say, then they wouldn't be able to sell the franchise on. Um, there are terms in the agreement um, around right to sell and there are terms in the franchise agreement around um, termination clauses. Um, and if as the franchisor, you turn around and go, right, that's it, you're out um, and you haven't got substance to, to back that up, um, it's not fair because they've invested a lot of time and money and um, mm energy into building the business um, but also it could land you in in hot water legally as well that said if it is something really serious and you do need to terminate their agreement you need to make sure that your solicitors included something in your franchise agreement to enable you to to do that and then it goes back to what we were talking about right at the beginning where you will need to be able to step into their email step into their social media accounts because if you're on uh, leaving things on bad terms not bad terms you never want to leave things on bad terms but maybe the franchisee isn't ready to exit but you're having to force that um they're not necessarily going to be forthcoming with allowing you access if you haven't already got it yeah so you need to take charge of that quite quickly as well so they damage causing you more damage as well but yeah and be able to contact their customer list etc as well so you know this is not this isn't something you enter in lightly and you talked about a lot, a lot about your the mindset towards doing this how how does your business help um people that want to go into the the world of franchising mm. um well <laughs> um i start off with a um a, a sort of half day session around why, why do you want to franchise, what the pitfalls are. Um, as you've gathered, I could talk about franchising until the cows come home, um, but it needs to be the right decision. Um, no one should jump straight in and go, right, I'm going to franchise my business. And um, it needs to be the right decision for you. So I do that half day workshop. And then at the end of that, have a one-to-one -one with everyone and um, just go through whether it is the right decision or not. And I'm, like I say, I'm, <laughs> we're all human. I'm not Miss Perfect. We're all still learning. Mm. Um, but I've been in the industry for long enough to be able to, to know in my gut if I feel that that person and that business is the right at that time to move forward. And if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong and someone else might want to work with, with that person. Um, but I would rather be upfront and say, and then once um, once we've gone forward from that, and like I say, about 70% of people, I, I will cut at that point and say, actually, no, I don't feel this is right. Um, then we work together on a 12 week program um, that guides through the steps. And I'm not saying you're going to franchise your business in 12 weeks. Right. Nope. I was going to ask that, how, long, how long would it take? I was like, wow. Well, yeah, no, no, no. Hero is a hero. <laughs> Um, what I'm doing is providing you with the tools that need to be done through those 12 weeks. Um, and there's usually about a six month gap where you're doing your homework from the masterclass to the start of the 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. So you've already got some good foundations in there. Um, 
everything that we do is through um, socials, through Zoom, through the virtual world. Um, but there is also a franchisor retreat as well that is well overdue um, for new franchisors that was supposed to have happened summer 2020. But <laughs> there'll be some catching up to do, won't there? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's it's a great program. It's really comprehensive. I'm completely biased, obviously, because I wrote it. <laughs> um, but it just makes sure that you've got all the tools in place. And then after that, you've got unlimited access to me in the Facebook group, the private Facebook group, um, so that you can um, ask me any questions you want and um, all support each other on our, our journeys. Is, is it... Um a set process or is it a bit like asking how long a piece of string is how long it takes to franchise your business yeah so it's very much dependent on the individual that's franchising because um for example we touched before we came on i set my businesses up as a single mum um i've now got married <laughs> um, literally only a few weeks ago so i'm still quite excited about it um but all through that process as a single mum with two children juggling lots of different pressures on a pet care business it probably took me a lot longer than someone who's got their salon set up as a management model got um someone in in place as a head groomer who's doing some of the admin as well and um dealing with um the day-to-day -day stuff that frees them up to focus purely on mm. building that operations manual and documenting what happens when a customer walks through the door and how that um each each stage of that customer journey is mapped out um and then all the back end stuff as well um i'll give you one top tip though <laughs> is that i always recommend that you have a franchise or operational map, operations manual and a franchisee operations manual so you've got a secret manual that is just for you and your head office team and then you've got the franchisee one as well so you've got copy and paste templates that you've laid out that your team can copy and paste and send off to franchisee inquiries for example and things like that and there's a system and process for everything everything absolutely everything, everything. And, and do you help um people that have already franchised their business do you offer help to existing franchisees uh, franchisors that maybe need some help or advice or some support yeah both um so i work with franchisees and franchisors um and i think that um being a franchisee um is again all about mindset and making sure um that you, you've got the right mindset to understand that what the franchisor is doing um is in your best interests even if you don't always see it um and you don't like change sometimes um it's really important to to make sure that um that you've got the right mindset so i help with mindset i help with business growth goal setting and um innovation um as well and work on um i try not to do so much one-to-one -one work anymore but um i like helping so yeah <laughs> so if any of our if any of our listeners are thinking about going into a franchise they can come and seek support and guidance and help from yourself as well yeah absolutely um and there are so you, you should always do your due diligence around the franchise or and i've got some great top tips around making sure that you're you're going with the right franchise for you um because not everyone sets up their franchise ethically and like i said some people do see it as this magical money tree that's going to pop up at the bottom of the garden and don't give their franchisees that level of support that they really should get so yeah absolutely excellent so um we'll put all your links in the in the chat and the in the channel youtube and everything you also run a I wanted to touch on this because I thought it was quite interesting. You also run a, a Facebook group called the Top 20%. And I just want, thought maybe you could explain what that, that actually means. Yeah, absolutely. So the Top 20% um, 
is a group for pet preneurs predominantly um, who are the 20% of um, pet preneurs and entrepreneurs who make the world go round. Um, basically, it's for ambitious um, pet preneurs. It started off as a dog business support group through lockdown mm -hmm. um, and helping everyone keep abreast of the changes that were going on. Um, unfortunately, due to some personal circumstances, I wasn't able to be as active in the group as I wanted to. Um, and a lovely lady called Petra, who's a pet photographer, stepped in and, um, and managed the group for me and did an amazing job. Um, so when um, lockdown ended, when um, things sort of started to go back to whatever this normal is, um, the group started to quieten down and we weren't getting as many people joining um, and not as many people posting. Um, and Petra and I had the conversation around, well, do, do we just close the group? Do we just stop the group? Um, and decided actually to give it a new lease of life because we've got some amazing people in there and make it the top 20% of petpreneurs and entrepreneurs because a lot of the um, entrepreneurs are suppliers to the business rather than pet businesses themselves. Mm -hmm. And it all comes from uh, Pareto's principle. I don't know if you're familiar with Pareto's principle with the 80-20 rule. You're going to have to explain um, it. <laughs> <laughs> so basically 80% of outcomes come from 20% of input. Um, so for example, 80% of your marketing will get you 20% of your customers. 80% of your um, customers will bring in 20% of your revenue. Um, so 80% of your um, work will um, will bring you in 20%. So it, it just, everything, you can apply the 80-20 rule to anything. It's not an exact science at all, but it, it just makes total sense. So I believe that 20% of business owners make 80% of the world go round. So uh, the top 20% was born. Um, so yeah. That's the top twenty percent. Come over and say hi. <laughs> I thought it'd be I thought it'd be interesting to explain that for the for the listeners. So, and what's um have you got any what's the plans for 2021, 2022? You know, you're growing the the franchise business school and yeah. So um, I've got Wizzy Woo's Kids Clubs, which is the financial literacy for children. Um, we're partnering with some amazing schools at the moment, doing some amazing work in delivering financial literacy training to four to 11 year olds, um, which is, is just so important. Um, and, you know, how is a six-year-old supposed to understand how you're paying for your shopping when you're just dabbing a bit of plastic on a a pad and walking out um mm -hmm. how is that quantifiable to them so it's something that i'm really really keen to uh to make a big impact on so 2022 um sees wizzy Woos, um partnering with some more awesome schools and of course helping lots of ethical pet businesses to franchise and um make a big splash on the world excellent and um, could you just let us know how we get a hold of you What's the uh, web address and email and how do we get yeah, yeah. So franchisebusinessschool.com um, is the, the website. Info at franchisebusinessschool.com <laughs> is the email. Um, and or just drop me a, a message on Facebook or through the top 20% group. Awesome. And how about WYSIWOOs? I want to include the WYSIWOOs link as well. because like, We've got a lot of parents in the group, a uh, parent myself, and I think that's really important what you're doing with that as well. So. So it's literally just wizzywoos.com. I'm a big believer in keeping things simple. <laughs> um, so that's W I W Z I W O S.com. Um, and the email is wizzy at wizzywoos.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, so much for sharing all your knowledge and uh, inspiring people. It sounds like Catherine's going to be uh, a franchisor at some point. Uh, she's with the questions that's going on in there so maybe that's something that she's thinking about um certainly learned a, a fair bit myself on how to 
like franchising and how it all works and the terms and, and stuff like that. So um, we'll put all your links in the comments. We'll put all your links on YouTube. Uh, I think there's a, you said there's an ebook as well to. Oh yeah, I'll pop you over the link if you want to share it about the group. Um, it's just the 10 most common mistakes that franchisors make when they're franchising um, their business. So I'll pop you over a link to that so you can share it out. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time and we'll You're very catch up soon. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.